Good afternoon, everybody. This is Claire Skenselberry from NIA, and I am delighted to start our Nano in Action webinar today, Nano Composites. This webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to access it on YouTube after uh, we have finished and we've converted it into the correct format. So I would like to welcome everybody today to who is joining us and also our members for making great efforts in contributing towards the presentations today. As you know, the Nano in Action series of webinars from NIA is designed to help demonstrate the application of nanotechnology into end products and processes. And with our first webinar focusing on textiles late last year, which proved very popular, this webinar focuses on the use of nanomaterials in composites, which gives us a huge field to address as composites are used in all areas of manufacturing now, in particular areas such as uh, automotive manufacturing planes. So there is a lot of information that we can share with you and we hope that it's interesting. The aim of the webinars is to give non-specialists primarily an understanding into how nanomaterials are used and the impacts that this has for the organizations that produce them and use them. We have three really great presenters with us today. We have Ben Hargreaves from Conventive Composites, who will be giving us an overview of the creation of composites. Then we will move to NIA member Steve from BN Nano, who produced nanomaterials which are then used in composites. And finally, we have Jan from the Czech Republic and Pardum Nanotechnology, who will be looking at novel ways of producing uh, composites using nanomaterials. At the end of the presentations, we will kick out all of the non-members of NIA and have a closed session where NIA members will discuss um, aspects of the presentations with the speakers. As I've already mentioned, this is being recorded and will be available on YouTube to all the registered participants. And we will share those. We will share the slides from today also with our members. We have you all on mute, if that's OK, because this is a fairly popular meeting and we would like to keep the audio quality as good as possible for you now and also in the recording for YouTube. So. There is no such thing as a free lunch, which those of you who have attended our previous webinars will know. So I'm going to give a really short overview of NIA and the work that we do before handing you over to our first presenter, Ben. As many of you will know, we are the Industrial Association for Nanotechnologies worldwide, and we support the development of innovations across all sectors that will help support novel products and processes, and we support both the science and the business and the policy around this to create a mature market for nanomaterials as possible. We work primarily from Brussels as the center of the world, but we also have skilled team spread across Belgium, the UK and the Netherlands. And we bring a number of skill sets into NIA, so as well as long-standing industrial and scientific um, knowledge, we bring regulatory standards and also scientific communication skills into the association. Our members are quite diverse, so I'm not going to list them all, but we go from large companies which work across all sectors and all applications. We have a lot of small to mid-size companies through from startups up to quite well established companies that operate across borders and there again are across all sectors. So we have uh, companies working in nanomedicines, diagnostics, through to production of novel materials, composites. It's an extremely broad collection of organizations together. We are increasingly supported by membership from the research sector, and that's both universities and also centers of excellence for research such, such as IMEC. So that allows us to support members with access into the latest research and some of the harder questions associated with nanomaterials, of which there are many. We are also supported by members from within specialist service provider organizations. Uh, and I can give you several examples on the screen in front of you. They range very much as well. So we have regulatory and standard specialists such as Blue Frog Scientific and Yordas. And we also have safety um, and you know, governance specialists such as TAMAS and Douglas Connect. 
We are very lucky to also have legal representation within members who can look very much at the tougher regulatory questions around accessing market. And finally, we have a number of associations as part of the as part of NIA to help support nanomaterials and technology development on a national level. So there's something for everyone and our members are all very nice and talk to each other on a very regular basis to share good practice and insights into nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. Our services primarily exist around regulatory priorities where we support very much members to understand their route to market, whether that is with a product that they have themselves or a very early stage material that they think has value as potential product. And we do that through monitoring global developments within regulatory areas and passing information to members, taking part in broad based consultations so that industrial requirements from novel regulations are met as much as possible. We have built a longstanding um, regulatory monitoring database where members can access the latest regulatory information across a number of sectors. And we also act as sector stakeholder to a number of different organizations, including ECHA, EFSA, and now the uh, EU on the new observatory. We also support members as much as possible through business and scientific networking. And there are a number of different actions we have. And we're lucky that our members are so diverse because it allows us to undertake a lot of different activities. So for example, we run a nanotechnology innovation council, which helps to monitor latest developments and disruptive technologies that members see supporting them through their development of technologies and materials. We undertake a number of collaborations through in different industrial associations. We have a funding tracker that looks at the latest potential sources of funding, both public and private, that members may use in developing novel products and processes. We attend a number of conferences each year and represent members. So our shiny new innovation this year is our Nano Pavilion, which we'll be taking to the ChemSpec exhibition in Basel in June. And there we have built a large stand where we will showcase eight different members and undertake activities showcasing nanotechnology across the two day conference. And finally, we work for members and indeed the wider community to try and build as much collaboration across sectors and organizations as possible. Our activities in the pipeline, um, and I know that a number of you take part in our activities on a regular basis. We have our next Nano in Business webinar looking at service providers within nanotechnology, and that will be coming up at the start of April. Our next Nano in Action webinar will be taking place on May the 7th, and that is very much focused on nano safety. And at the end of next week, we will have a really interesting insight into how nano associations serve the development of nanotechnology at a national level. And that's really important uh, to support local business communities to allow them to become larger and international. And in the pipeline, not yet scheduled with dates, is our next Nano in Action webinar, which will look at sport. And that is very specifically going to be in the first week of July to celebrate the, the fact that the Tour de France will start from Brussels during that week. And for our very lucky members, our office is in fact on the, the course of the time trial. So all members will be able to come and use our office and watch the time trial on that particular day. And the next nano in business um, topic in the pipeline is looking at intellectual property, and that is likely to be in September. And one final upcoming activity, which many of you will know about and many are attending, is our annual symposium on Wednesday of next week. So if you are not yet registered, I'm sure there's plenty of time for you to hop on the train and come and visit us in Brussels. And I will end my shameless plug of um, membership of NIA by saying our membership is open to all types of organizations, whether they're producing nanomaterials or not, um, or whether they are a business or a non-profit organization. Our community is very active, particularly as we strive to build the economic foundation of nanotechnology and nanomaterials, and it includes active contributions from many different types of organizations. So I think that takes me to the end of my plug for nanotechnology, sorry, for 
for Nia as a whole. And I will be very pleased to hand you over to our first presenter this afternoon, who is Ben. And I'm going to change screens while Ben is introducing himself um, and getting ready to present his slides. So thanks very much indeed, Ben. And you can say hello to everybody now. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just check you can all hear me OK. Are we OK, Claire? Very good. Thank you very much. Excellent. Right. Um, so, so yes, um, uh, my name is Ben Hargreaves. I work for Coventive Composites. Uh, and as Claire said, I'm, I'm doing the first presentation today. Uh, and really what this is, as, as you will see from the uh, from the slides, is, a, is an introduction to polymer nanocomposites. So so this this is potentially a very, very broad subject area. Uh, and what we're going to do over the next sort of 15 minutes is, is give you a bit of an introduction. OK, but uh, I, I guess first of all, just a quick word on, on Coventive. Uh, the shameless plugs continue just for, for one slide longer. Um, so we are a, a specialist services provider uh, in the field of polymer composites. Um, so, so what does that mean? Well, well we work with, with a variety of organizations um, across sectors um, who, who share in common uh, a, a desire to, to develop composite materials uh, or products therefrom uh, and take them to market. Um, and we're able to support them, you know, wherever they are on, on that journey. So if it's at the very, very early stages, we might be providing some, some market intelligence, um, some advice on, on market entry strategies, benchmarking against competition. Um, we do that sort of thing for, uh, for government bodies as well. So we've previously provided um, advice on trends in the industry uh, for, for UK government funding bodies to help them direct um, uh, future funding um, calls and programs. Um, we work a lot with um, with developers of um, polymers, so they might come to us looking to add some some functionality um, to their product. So we'll help them out with some uh, materials and, uh, and process development support. Um, similarly, we work a lot with uh, with manufacturers of, of nanomaterials uh, who are looking for for ways to you know to to uh, to explore new applications. For their materials. If we then start thinking about, um, you know, people that are ready to, to be manufacturing components, then we can help them out with design, um, design advice, structural analysis, uh, providing independent verification of um, uh, structural calculations, those sort of things. Uh, moving further along, we offer a, a wide variety of pilot scale um, manufacturing equipment and, and, and prototyping capability. So we cover all of the standard composites processing, uh, for those of you that are familiar, uh, things like resin transfer molding, compression molding, injection molding. Um, but we also have one or two more um, uh, specialist pilot lines that, that may be set as apart from some others. So we have pilot scale uh, pre-pregging capability, uh, pilot scale thermoplastic tape manufacturing, and uh, pilot scale thermoplastic protrusion, amongst others. Uh, all of that is backed up with um, uh, with a suite of materials characterization and testing equipment, so um, mechanical testing stuff, um, fairly obviously, but also particularly for some of the conductive nanomaterials. You know, we, we like to look at uh, electrical conductivity of uh, polymer composites as, as one way of uh, um, of checking dispersion, let's say, or checking um, the suitability of the materials that we make. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps most relevant for today, is uh, we offer composite material training. Um, and the, the presentation I'm going to give today is taken from one of our uh, training modules, our introduction to polymer nanocomposites module. So really what we're going to cover over the next um, 12 minutes or so is um, is the following things. You know, we'll, we'll talk about, well, what, what do we actually mean when we say uh, a nanocomposite? Um, I'll go on to then talk about, uh, you know, in general terms, what polymer nanocomposites are made up of. Uh, what I'm not going to cover today, which I'll, I'll leave to uh, to the later speakers and, and which we discuss in in full in, you know, in the full version of this presentation, is you know is getting into the detail of how nano nanocomposites work. As I say, I'll leave that for uh, for the other presenters uh, to follow. Uh, and then finally, um, we'll flag up some of the key challenges that are associated with using nanocomposites. Okay, so so page one then. Well, you know, what are these polymer nanocomposites that we're here to talk about? Well, can we look to any formal definitions to help us out here? Um, well, the answer is well in in part. So um, the EU does have a uh, a formal definition of of a nanomaterial, and 
you can read that um, for yourselves. But to, to paraphrase, effectively, what we're talking about here is um, a material in which 50% or more of the particles in a, in a sample of that material um, has one or more external dimensions in the range of uh, or, or less than 100 nanometers. So if that's a nanomaterial, then okay, there's there's no formal definition for a for a nanocomposite. Uh, but but by extending this definition for nanomaterials here, then what we can say is well, a polymer nanocomposite is uh, is any material in which we have a polymer, um, and in that polymer we have dispersed a a filler or, or fillers. Um, which meets these criteria above. So if we've got our polymer and a filler in there with, with dimensions or a dimension of less than 100 nanometers, um, then we call that a, a polymer nanocomposite. What might these fillers look like? Um, we can broadly categorize them um, as you see on this next slide here. Um, so we have the spherical nanoparticles. So these things will have a, a, a diameter in the sub 100 nanometer range. Um, so to give you some examples, these are things like nano titanium dioxide, nano silicon dioxide. Then we have the nano platelets, um, things like bentonite clays, graphene, and, and specifically hexagonal boron nitride. In these cases here, what we're talking about is a material in which the uh, the thickness here is is less than 100 nanometers. Lateral dimensions of these things can be in tens of microns plus, um, but very very thin. And then the third type are the, are the nanotubes or nanowires, um, things like carbon nanotubes, um, particular types of nanoclay, the holocyte uh, nanoclays, um, nanofibrillated cellulose. Uh, you, you're going to hear later today about um, boron nitride nanotubes uh, as well. Um, and with these materials, again, it's, um, it's the... Um, it's the cross-section here that will be in the, in the nanometer range, but again, these can range um, Tens, tens of microns plus uh, in length. So why all the interest in these materials, I guess, is the next question. Um, in, in very, very simple terms, what, what we're looking at here is, is can we take a, a very, very small um, loading of, of our nanomaterial additive and deliver a large improvement um, in performance? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes, uh, a qualified yes. Uh, I suppose the thing to point out here, uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar, is um, the reason we, we're looking to do this is, is these nanomaterials and uh, some of these common materials, when in nano form, um, display um, some ex exceptional properties. So we might be talking uh, exceptionally high electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, uh, exceptional mechanical properties. Um, so really what we're looking, looking to, to do is uh, is, is impart those properties on a on a bulk material in this case on our uh, in our bulk composite um, at very very low loading, uh, and if we can do if we can do that at very very low loading, that means we're adding very very little weight, um, which for a lot of the uh, the applications where we're we're looking to include uh, incorporate composites um, is really what we're looking for. You know, we're looking for mass transport applications where we don't want to be um, where we're looking for fuel savings, those sort of things. So anytime we can add functionality without adding weight. Um, then we're on to a winner. So here are a few um, examples of uh, applications of specifically graphene uh, nanocomposites. So you'll see there are there are applications in sort of sporting goods um, uh, at the moment. You know, we're looking for improved mechanical properties, um, uh, maybe uh, maybe reduced friction. Um, there are also more experimental applications at this stage in, in sort of aircraft. So we've got you know, an unmanned aircraft here. We've got a, a demonstration of a, a, an aircraft leading um, you know, wing leading edge here. And we'll, we'll come back to, um, to, to some of these applications perhaps a little bit later, but just to give you a feel for, for some of the areas where, where these materials might be used at the moment. The next section then is going to talk about how we go about making a polymer nanocomposite. In very, very simple terms, the, the two key ingredients that we need are a polymer of some description. Now, um, that might be a thermoplastic or it might be a thermosetting material. And we need some sort of nanofiller, which might be in, in dry powder form. It, it might be supplied as a, as a master batch or a, or a suspension in, in, um, in some liquid or other. For our what we might class more traditional composites, we would we would typically have a, a, a reinforcement fiber of some sort in there as well. 
that might be a, you know a woven fabric, a carbon fiber reinforcement, a, a glass fiber reinforcement, natural fibers, those sort of things as well. We have all those ingredients. We need to then bring them together to make our polymer nanocomposites. And there are um, we'll look sort of separately at, uh, at thermosetting and, and, and thermoplastic um, composites here. So let's start with the thermosetting nanocomposites. Um, Typically, what we're looking at here is using some sort of high shear mixing technique um, to, to break up the agglomerated nanoparticles uh, and then to disperse those nanofillers evenly um, throughout the polymer resin. So we might use something like um, rotor stator mixers here yeah, in a high shear. These can be batch, these can be inline mixers. We might use something like a triple roll mill where the material is fed through here and, and passes through a series of rollers with, uh, with decreasing, typically decreasing uh, gap size. We can also use what you might term non-contact methods like uh, like ultrasonication, uh, maybe in the form of a, a probe like this that would sit in a uh, in a container of our um, thermosetting resin and nanoparticles, uh, or we can use um, ultrasonic bats as well. Typically, these these would be limited to the lab. These are obviously uh, much more amenable to um, to scale. Once we've then got our um, nano-filled thermosetting resin, in theory, we can use standard composites processing techniques to, to produce some final parts. That might be um, resin transfer molding, might be infusion, hand layup, pre-pregging. Um, but there is a, a rather big but here. Uh, and there are a number of factors that, that affect how viable it is to use each of these techniques for making components. Um, the first of these is, is resin viscosity. So um, when we, um, if we are able to, to disperse um, nanoparticles, nanomaterials um, evenly through a thermosetting resin, um, in doing so, we are typically going to see big increases in, in viscosity at, at relatively low loading um, to the point where things might, you know, might become very, very difficult to work with those materials. Um, so if we're starting with a uh, with a resin that's high viscosity, then then we might be in trouble. You know, we've got to choose our resins uh, accordingly. The second thing that we need to consider is what type of reinforcement fabric are we using? Um, there are a variety of uh, of different uh, fabric formats that we can use, of different aerial weights, of different um, uh, fiber architectures. Uh, and some of those are more easy to to work with than others when we're talking about uh, trying to trying to um, uh, infuse them with uh, with nanofilled resins. So if we if you imagine a sort of heavy fabric, where we've got very tightly bundled fibers. Then if we're if we're using a composites processing technique which relies on infusing uh, our nanofilled resin from one side of that fabric through another over over potentially you know relatively long distances. Then, then really what we're trying to do here is, or what we're effectively doing is, is filtering out the nanomaterials, uh, which is clearly not what we want. We need them evenly distributed throughout our final part. Uh, the nanofiller particle dimensions uh, play a role too. Um, obviously, the, the larger the particles, the more likely they are to be filtered by the reinforcement during any infusion type processes. Um, so this particularly applies to to things like the um, you know the nanoplatelet materials, the um, the nanotube materials, where where yes, okay, they're uh, they're nano in 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 one or two dimensions, uh, but in the other dimension, these things can still be, as I said earlier, microns across, and and that can cause us big problems. Um, and and for these certainly for these two reasons here, you know, this is this is why typically the the sort of infusion processes, the RTM, the vacuum infusion. Don't necessarily lend themselves to, to working with nano composites, uh, where we see much more of, a, of an application for, for thermosetting resins um, is is in prepreg technology. And I'm not going to go into the details of how prepregs are manufactured here, but um, the, the the path that the resin has to, to travel is is much 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 shorter, um, and so the um, the potential for filtering out material uh, nano materials is is much 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 reduced. Uh, the final thing on here is the nanofiller loading itself, and uh, as I alluded to with the top point, um, very quickly, typically, as we as we increase loading, um, we get sharp increases in viscosity. So uh, it varies nanoparticle by nanoparticle, but but typically, you know, you, you only need to get to one, two, three, four percent loading, 
um, before potentially you 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 end up with a viscosity that, that's just not workable. For the thermoplastics, um, there are typically two methods: um, melt intercalation and uh, in situ polymerization. Um, melt intercalation. What what we're effectively talking about here is compounding, really, in in simple terms. Um, so we're using a compounding extruder typically to um, to incorporate our nanomaterials into uh, a thermoplastic, um, and then as you would with any other compounding process, that material is typically you know pelletized, ready for subsequent processing by whatever thermoplastic processing route, injection molding, for example. Um, with that process, there are a number of variables that um, that we can play around with, and, and depending on what we do at each of these, we can have a big influence on on the final properties um, of our um, nano reinforced thermoplastic. So, for example, we can play around with the screw design, you know, how um, what the pitch of the screws is, uh, well, the teeth on the screws, what the what the spacing is between uh, between the um, the grooves on the screw. We can play around with screw speed. We can play around with with barrel temperature and the different zone temperatures. We can alter the position that we um, that we feed our, our nano material into the extruder. All of these can um, can have an influence. So just to give you an example from uh, from some work we we previously done on on graphene, um, if we increase barrel temperature, we get an increase in electrical conductivity. Um, if we increase mold temperature, we get an increase in electrical conductivity. Um, if we reduce injection speed, increase in electrical conductivity. If we increase gate size, increase in electrical conductivity. So basically, if we, to summarise, I guess, if we're reducing shear and increasing cooling time, then we can see um, orders of magnitude difference um, in electrical conductivity of the material that we're um, that's coming out of the extruder. Um, mechanical properties less affected. So again, it, it depends on your application how important this sort of thing is. Um, for the in-situ polymerization um, used for, uh, for incorporating things like organomodified clays, graphenes, um, this process if effectively involves dispersing your, your filler first in a monomer, um, which, which then enters the spacing between a, a layered material like a clay or a graphite. Um, and then we carry out a polymerization with the growing polymer chains, then helping to separate and exfoliate it, this layered material as the polymerization progresses. Uh, I realise I'm running already over time, so I'll, I'll hurry on to the uh, the challenges that typically need to be overcome. Number one, managing the height. So again, let's take graphene as an example, um, but you know this this can apply to carbon nanotubes and and will apply, I'm sure, to to other new nanomaterials as they're discovered. Um, you know, we we see with graphene, it's uh, well, it's a miracle material. It's going to change the face of this industry. It's going to change the face of that industry. You're going to be having it on your skin, and we can eat it for breakfast, whatever else. Um, and you know, there, there needs to be some um, some tempering of that with uh, with realization. Um, the danger, of course, and, and again, we see this with with all sorts of new material introductions, not not just nanomaterials, is that we get all of this hype, and then to the outside world, seemingly nothing happens. Um, so then we, you know, a few years down the line, we get these sort of headlines. Well, you know, why are we so slow to adapt graphene? Whatever happened to graphene? Um, you know, and, uh, clearly we need a we need a much more uh, balanced view on these sort of things. Um, and, and if you look back on uh, the sort of timeline of development of, of other nano composite materials, it's probably fair to say that you know the, the later incarnations, the, the graphenes, for example, are are probably still on track. So if we go back and look here, um, you know, one of the earliest commercial examples of a, of a nano composite were, were some of these nylon six clay uh, nano composites that Toyota developed for, for various um, underbonnet components in the mid 80s. Um, <clears throat> or sorry, they began that research in the mid 80s. It wasn't until sort of early 90s that the, that the first um, real world applications, the first, you know, volume parts um, were produced around the same sort of time is, is when carbon nanotubes were discovered. Fast forward 10 years and we see the first applications in, in sporting goods. Um, fast forward another 10 years and then we start to see applications of carbon nanotubes in, you know, in, in structural um, uh, or semi-structural components. So going back to that slide I showed earlier with the graphene applications, uh, yes you could argue that okay it's all very exciting but it's all sort of sporting goods, you know, it's 
how much of it is is actually marketing versus performance enhancements well you know it, it's maybe 50 50 but again if we look at the timeline you know 2004 is when, when graphene was first isolated at the university of manchester and, and those sort of sporting goods applications started appearing um you know four or five years ago um so really you know we're there's still time to come and there's still progress being made um for us to see those sort of semi-structural and structural applications for uh for graphene reinforced um composites and, and the same will apply to to other nanomaterials as um as they are developed the technical challenges then let's let's cut to these um number one um, we talked about it earlier. It's, it's achieving this good dispersion of the nanofiller in the host polymer. Um, and for many nano nanomaterials, you know, they don't want to be dispersed. They, uh, you know, they uh, they want to agglomerate. They want to stick together. We might be um, there might be a big mismatch in in, in polarity and surface energy between the, the nanomaterial and the, um, the the polymer that we want to disperse it in. So we might need some surface functionalization to help us with that. Um, but that that's not a you know that's not a trivial uh, issue to overcome. If we do overcome that, then challenge number two is okay. We've got a big pot of uh, a polymer uh, with nanomaterial nicely dispersed throughout it. What happens then when we try and make a part? What happens when we try and infuse this through some fibers? What happens when we do uh, when we injection molder material? Do we still get that same distribution? Do we get a uniform distribution of nanofiller in the part? If it's not uniform. Can we understand what the distribution is and does that you know still give us the properties that we need of course we've got to do all of this uh, in, in a cost effective way um, that, that goes without saying what we've not touched on uh, at all here are, are the health and safety concerns um, and again that that can be a big issue there's um, uh, again there are, there are the perceived health and safety concerns there are the there are the actual health and safety concerns so there's a need to, to balance and, and address both of those different areas. Uh, and assuming we can address all of that above, um, the final sort of spanner in the works is, is a quite often there is a lack of consistency in, in the raw materials themselves. And if we're being honest, there can also be a, a lack of consistency in, in how those materials are described. Uh, and that can really add to, uh, to the complications. So to give you an example of that, you know, here are a, a whole host of names for, um, you know, graphene and, and, and related products. Um, and you know, if you, if I go out and say, all right, I want to buy some graphene, well, here are my options. I can have anything from, you know, pristine monolayer um, CVD um, graphene at this end, and you know, being slightly facetious here, but what some people market as graphene is 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 perhaps not. Um, now that's not to say that you know over at this end here is bad and, and this end here is good. There are there are applications for for all of these different materials, and what's what's right for one application might be a multi-layer, um, highly expanded graphite or, or graphene nanoplatelet. You know, take um, uh, choose your brand, whoever's going to supply it for you. Uh, but for other applications, you know, really what you might need is is the monolayer or one or two layer graphene. Um, but if we don't know what we're getting, and if we're not getting the same thing every time, um, then it really makes it difficult for, for people that are trying to develop applications to, uh, to move forward. So you, just to expand on that, you know, if, if you imagine you're a, um, a producer of nanomaterials and you want to go out to the market and, and evaluate what you've got, so you might be producing a variety of different grades. You might have, let's say if it's a platelet-like type material, you might have Two or three different thickness variations, two or three different lateral dimension versions, and then you might have the option to, to perform some surface functionalization on that. And then you might be wanting to evaluate that in, in a range of different applications in different sectors. Um, and then to throw an extra layer of complication on, you might choose um, to, to incorporate that nanomaterial into a polymer by a high shear mixing method, or you might need a sonication method. Uh, you know, you might not be sure which is the best way to go. So it's easy to see how a, a potential you know test matrix for a, a company developing nanomaterials can suddenly balloon into you know a, an enormous you know an enormous project in itself 
Okay, so I'm, I've gone well over time, so I shall wrap up now. Um, the key things, I guess, to, to take from this are, uh, number one, uh, we, can, we can prepare uh, nanocomposites from both thermosetting and thermoplastic polymers. Uh, for the thermosetting ones, there are a number of factors uh, that affect the ability to successfully produce fiber-reinforced components. So we need to take care when we select the different resins, the reinforcement fabrics, the, the loadings of material that we put in there. For the thermoplastics, uh, again, the, the choice of processing parameters can have significant effect uh, and influence on our final properties. But if we can get all of this right, um, then you know evidence has shown that um, that we can get some significant improvements in properties, um, be it strength, stiffness, fracture toughness, and so on. So, uh, in doing that, we will open up a whole host of applications for these materials. Um, but it will take uh, time and effort. Okay, so I, I understand that we're going to we we'll leave we're going to leave questions until the end of uh, of all three presentations. So I shall I shall be quiet now, having run massively over time. But thank you very much for listening. Cheers. Thanks very much indeed. And it was extremely interesting. I am now going to take the screen back to me with a bit of technical wizardry as follows and introduce our next speaker Steve but before Steve says hello a lot of the comments that uh, Ben made are ex exactly what we look at every day with near in terms of enabling the commercial applications of nano because many of the really high potential materials still have a long way to go before they can make it into a consistently produced uh, consistent quality uh, final product and that's the really interesting business aspect of delivering nano right from the early stage materials development into a final product on the market but without further ado I will introduce Steve our next presenter who is actually a nanomaterials producer himself and so he can talk about the challenges that he has in uh, developing materials into it, it, um, composites as an end product so, Steve, do you want to introduce yourself and say hello? Yes, hello. Good afternoon. First, we would like to say thank you to Nia for giving us the opportunity to speak with you here today about our new material, boron nitride nanotubes, and how we believe we can incorporate this product into composites. Um, as mentioned, my name is Steve Olsensky. I'm one of the founders of BN Nano, and we are excited for the chance to speak with you today. Uh, next slide, please. I want to start with just a little bit about our organization very briefly. Um, it, it's interesting. You know, we started this company with the goal of providing a consistent, high value, high quality supply of low cost boron nitride nanotubes. So it fits very much in line with what we heard earlier. Um, we like to say that we are a, an organic startup. And by that, we mean we did not spin out of any labs, universities, academic institutions, or anything like that. We came up with the ideas, the process, and the intellectual property on our own. We raised money and started the company in March of 2016. Uh, we moved into an old textile mill in a small town called Burlington, North Carolina, which is just west of the Research Triangle Park in 2017. And then we stayed under the radar until we had all of our IP filed, which we did early in early last year. And then shortly thereafter, we went into what we call full production. And by full production, we mean we can produce quantities in excess of kilograms per month, if not greater, if, it, if the demand was that high today. And while we are a small company, we are uh, pretty experienced in developing and commercializing new technologies. We are business leaders, material scientists, and engineers. We've got product developers with many, many years experience in very complex material systems. We have a seasoned sales staff in marketing as well as being uh, having a very good track record of being IP creators with the commercialization of IP being the goal. Um, next slide, please. So fundamentally, just as we heard before, uh, boron nitride nanotubes, while it is a new material, it is essentially an additive. It's a nano additive. And just like we heard, uh, small additions have a big impact. And a lot of what we're doing can be analogous to carbon nanotubes. And carbon nanotubes do have a history of improving materials, uh, improving properties such as fatigue, fracture toughness, strength, modulus, impact energy. And you can expect the same, if not better, from the boron nitride nanotubes. And again, we, we are, if you will, riding on the coattails of a lot of the previous nanomaterials that have existed. 
And because of that, we're hopeful that we may be able to get into the marketplace a little bit sooner. And then also coupled with our business model of providing a low cost, high quality product, we think we can help get this material into, into new applications and new products uh, in a shorter time frame than we have seen. Next slide, please. And as we heard, the, the expectations do need to be tempered. There are serious limitations to carbon nanotubes and other nanomaterials. Um, the, adding the small amount can be tricky. Sometimes you get agglomerations when you get to the one to two weight percent. Uh, when you do get agglomerations, you weaken the composite as well. And to combat this, as we heard, you sometimes need to functionalize. And when you functionalize, you're adding costs, certainly, and you're also potentially adding contaminants to your material, and you are creating some of that inconsistency in that supply chain. And in, on some occasions, you might have some unintended consequences, such as when you uh, get galvanic corrosion when you add carbon nanotubes into some materials due to the, the electrical properties. And some of these shortcomings is where people start to begin to look for new materials. And, and this is where boron nitride nanotubes came in. It is a, it's a relatively new material. Next slide, please. It has been in the laboratory for a couple of decades now, and there has been, been some research. But historically, there has not been a, a large enough supply or a consistent enough supply to even begin to think about commercializing anything that was done in the laboratory. And again, these, this material is probably a close cousin to the boron nitride nanotubes. They're similar in size with diameters of 10 to 20 nanometers in length nominally in the 10 to 20 micron length. A mechanical is similar to carbon nanotubes, but they do have some interesting differences. But I, I believe today the biggest challenge historically has been supply. And in the limited research that was done in the laboratory, the material showed great promise. But without having that availability, there, was, there wasn't really an interest that sustained any momentum. We took this on as a challenge when we formed a company. We believed that we had a way, that we had discovered and developed a way to make this in high volumes, at a low cost, very rapidly and very consistently so that we can begin to introduce this material into the marketplace. The other, the other thing that we thought of is, is Nanomaterials, as we heard previously, sometimes are hard to handle. So we also wanted to develop and engineer this material in such a way that maybe we can take out some of the needs for functionalization or some of the, some of the adverse handling problems. Next slide, please. And while boron nitride nanotubes are similar to carbon nanotubes in, in areas and modules and strength and thermal conductivity, there are some very key differences. I think one of the most interesting is that the boron nitride nanotubes are electrical insulators. If you combine the electrical insulating properties with the thermal conductivity, you get an interesting material that has a lot of potential applications that carbon nanotubes just couldn't address because they, they are such good electrical conductors. You can start to make novel heat sinks for microelectronics and, and put these in areas which you just haven't been able to do before. They're also very thermally stable with an oxidation resistance up to 850 C which again opens the window a little bit more for potential applications, is now we can begin to go into new materials that historically have not been able to accept some of the, some of the current nanomaterials. And then another interesting component is that because it's a boron material, it, it's a very good neutron absorber, which opens the possibility for some very cost-effective and I would say environmentally friendly, if you will, ways to, to protect for radiation. So while this has really opened up the opportunities for some new areas. When you compare side by side with carbon nanotubes, there might be still some advantages to boron nitride nanotubes. Next slide, please. Don't have too much time to go into too much of the data, but we could certainly share that if anyone has any questions. Uh, but in a few side by side studies, carbon nanotubes and boron nanotubes, when put in the same materials, boron nitride nanotubes have begun to exhibit some better improvements to the properties. In, in studies with epoxy, in a side-by-side -side study, the boron nitride nanotubes at the same loading had a tendency to show a, a greater increase in the modulus. Um, they also demonstrated that they were able to, to disperse better in the epoxy. And uh, we, we think we know why. And this is pretty interesting. In, in this particular study, the carbon nanotubes were limited to, to about two weight percent loading, and they were able to get boron nitride nanotubes up to about 5%. So there was just some evidence that we could get more 
into the mixture, not only mixing it easier. In a study of reinforced resins, the boron nitride nanotubes were shown to have a greater increase in the fracture toughness and the ultimate tensile strength. And again, side by side, what this shows is that, that say if we could get on a cost parity with carbon nanotubes, that potentially we could not only open new applications, but maybe we could become a competitor to carbon nanotubes. And I'll speak more to the cost here briefly. And then there's lots of information in press, just as there was when the people discovered graphene, that it was the, the greatest new material. There's a lot of interest in boron nitride nanotubes. And I would say, just as we mentioned before, we probably need to temper our expectations, but I do think there is a great deal of promise uh, for this material. Next slide, please. So when we started BN Nano and started developing this material, we thought about it differently. Again, we wanted to, from the onset, have a cost-effective, easy-to-use, consistent supply of nanomaterials. And that's exactly what we've done at BN Nano. So we, we've taken the nanotube and we've been able to enhance it a bit further. What we did is we've engineered the nanotube further than just the tube itself. We have found a way to in situ do what we call a quasi-functionalization to the exterior of the nanotube. What this is, is this is a, a nanocrystal of hexagonal boron nitride that is nucleated on the outside surface. And what we have seen is the addition of this nanoparticle of hexagonal boron nitride, it promotes the dispersion into the suspension that you're trying to mix. It also makes it harder to pull the tubes out of the matrix, which gives it a better matrix adhesion and interlock. This material is chemically matched. It's just boron nitride. It's essentially thermally matched. So it has been, again, a, a very good way to quasi-functionalize it, to take that step out of the process to make it a little bit easier for our customers to use this material. It is still a nanomaterial. The dimensions of the diameter may have grown to, say, 20, uh, 15 to 20 nanometers. The, the length has remained unchanged. And this, another important part of that, this is part of our process. So this is not any uh, post-processing that we need to do. We do this in situ as part of our uh, as part of our process. Next slide, please. And again, don't have too much time, so we'll we'll very briefly talk about some some data. Uh, when we reinforced an epoxy with our nanobarbs and we did some flexural testing, we were able to get some pretty interesting results. And I'd like to start out by saying, so what we did here is a little, it was interesting. So we, we actually mixed this in our lab using some of the standard techniques that were mentioned before. Uh, no functionalization, no surfactants, no thinners. We just mixed this with standard processes. And then we shipped the material out of state where it sat in their lab for over a week. So this data is after about 10 days to two weeks of our material being pre-mixed. So there was no additional mixing done on site. They just took this and made the, the samples after a few weeks of shelf time, if you will. And at five weight percent and one weight percent, we did see improvements in flexural strength and modulus. Maybe not as much as we had, had hoped or expected, but upon failure analysis, what we saw was the failures of these parts were due to some agglomerates of other particles, other additives that they add into the material system. So we are doing some new testing now to take that variable out. And we are also going to start at a loading level as high as 7% and work our way down just to see, uh, you know, where the, where the actual sweet spot is for this material. Next slide, please. Now, I apologize, this may not show up that well, but what you're seeing here is a fracture surface of a sample of reinforced epoxy with our nanotubes. And in the, the dark image, what you see is the nanotubes coming out of the surface, and in the light image, you see the pits from where the, where the nanotubes are pulled away. And this image, and, and this slide is really just to show and demonstrate how well our, our material has dispersed and how well it adheres to the matrix. If you were able to look down in on, on the dark image where you see the nanotubes extending from the surface, what you see is that they only extend maybe a few, maybe 100 nanometers or so which is significantly less than some other nanotube materials when you look at them in a fracture surface. And this tells us that we are very well adhered to the matrix. And if you were to look at the sample, and you were to, if you were to calculate the distances between the nanotubes, you would also see this corresponds very well to the loading level of the nanotubes in this epoxy to show that we are very well dispersed. 
And again, this material was made with only normal mixing techniques. And it was a, a sample that sat for probably at least 10 days to two weeks. So it shows again, a very uniform distribution of nanobarbs. And it also shows that our material disperses very well and it stays very stable in the suspensions. Next slide, please. So what we've done at BN Nano is we have developed a process that makes consistent, high quality, low cost boron nitrate nanotubes. Um, they're primarily single wall. The samples that we make and ship to our customers are greater than 90% nanotubes. And the remaining 10% is going to just be free floating particles, nanoparticles of hexagonal boron nitride. These are not the same particles that are crystallized on the surface, these are just free floating. But I think most importantly to the consistency of the process, we don't need any catalysts, we don't need any additives or any other materials that could potentially be contaminants to the end product. So it again, is a very pure, very consistent supply. Um, it's also a high volume process. We wanted to be sure before we came out and, and told the world that we could provide this material that we had the ability to not only give kilograms if we needed to, but also give it at a very low cost. And just in the, if you look at the timelines of carbon nanotubes, it took many, many years to get to the prices where they are today. We are actually already the same cost as single wall carbon nanotubes in sample quantities. And if anyone was to need kilograms today, we would be on par or very close to the pricing of multi-wall carbon nanotubes. And we can stay there and improve that given the, given the demands. So I, I think as Ed mentioned before, you know, some of the some of the challenges were consistent supply, some of the challenges were how do you use it and the cost. And we believe that we have really addressed those at the onset of the business. Uh, next slide, please. And we can provide our boron nitride nanotubes, or, or what we call them nanobars, with the hexagonal boron nitride crystallized on the outside in three forms. We can supply our customers with dry powders. And we do that in, in grams today, and we have the ability to ship kilograms if necessary. But we also make custom suspensions. And we had heard before that this might help take away some of the challenges as well. Is we can, we can pre-mix our materials into the chemistry that you need, which would help aid in your process. And then we also offer custom compounding. You heard for some of the plastics. Our experience today is primarily in nylons and polyesters but we can certainly discuss and, and put our material in other materials if that is, that's what's necessary. But I think the key thing here to know is that this is a new material, but it is relatively mature when you compare to the other nanomaterials in that we can supply a consistent high volume supply at a low cost. Next slide, please. And I think we, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, why you would want to use boron nitride nanotubes. And some of it is because you can get into new applications with the electrical insulated properties and the high thermal stability. But it also is an area that provides an advantageous IP environment. And, and what we mean by that is if, if you were to do just a Google patent search, there's relatively few patents out there with boron nitride nanotubes. So it is a, it's a good area to really carve out a niche product or, or niche technologies for, for your organizations. And we are currently active not only producing the nanotubes and nanobars, but we're also developing products, both internally and with some strategic customers. And these, these areas are ranged, you know, the outside of composites, we are, we are doing research in novel heat sinks for microelectronics. Uh, we're working with textiles to use some of the, the fire retardant properties and some of the, uh, the other areas that would be, are interesting for textiles. We're heavily involved in some of the new additive manufacturing, be that 3D printing uh, all the way to cold spray, but even adding into things like coolants and dielectrics. So this is a, it's a very interesting material that it's in its infancy. And we believe that by, by looking at the problem differently, by not just trying to produce a nanomaterial that may have some interest, but by producing something that can be commercially available immediately, we think that this should help adopt this nanomaterial into new applications and new technologies. Next slide, please. And with that, we just want to, again, thank Nia for giving us the opportunity for speaking with you today. Uh, we would also like to say that we are also members and we see great value in being members of this organization and we would recommend anyone out there that's considering it to go ahead and join. 
uh, there's uh, tremendous resources for you in this organization. Um, if you have any additional question for us, uh, this is contact information for myself and Jason Taylor, who is the other co-founder of BNNO, and we appreciate your time, and thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Steve, and the checks in the post for the final advertising at the end of your presentation. But that was a really interesting presentation for me in particular because it really sums up what we found last year in, in our Nanotech Innovation Council, where members said we were looking for next generation materials and breakthrough, and it was much less about what the material is and much more about how you control it. And you saw the business model of being nano there based on not only what the materials themselves can do, but how they can be managed and their usability with you know, consistency within the industrial process. So that's a really interesting demonstration of the, how far down the pipeline you have to look in a value chain for your novel material. And it's also fascinating to see that, you know, given the length of time that carbon nanotubes have been maturing towards commercial use, that the sort of second generation materials are getting to market much more quickly. So it will be very interesting to see how market penetration happens for the various different materials there. So thanks again very much indeed, Steve. And we move rapidly to our final presenter of the afternoon, who is Yan, who I'm just handing over to now. So hopefully Yan will be able to switch on his screen and we can join his new presentation. So here we go, Yan. Yeah, we can see your slides. That's perfect. So take it away, please. Oh no, the slides are gone. Okay. Yeah, I know. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Now the slides are back. Okay. Thanks very much. So you see me. Perfect. Yeah, I had some problems with uh, internet connection, so I believe you will hear me and you will see all my slides. Uh, thank you, Nia, for, for giving me the opportunity to present today. I will go shortly uh, through our uh, company history uh, and then I will move to uh, application of our materials uh, in composite materials. Uh, Pergam is a Czech company. We are located in the Czech Republic, uh, right in the center of the uh, of the Europe. Uh, and our facility is located like 40 kilometers to the north from Prague. Uh, and uh, we are focusing on uh, development and production of uh, nanofiber materials. Uh, we are producing and developing polymeric nanofibers from different polymers, uh, mainly for separation and filtration applications. And uh, we are also developing and producing inorganic nanofibers, uh, which are used uh, for uh, various applications. Uh, you will hear and you will see later uh, where we apply those materials. Uh, basically, services our company is uh, providing is development of new nanofiber materials and applications. We are able to develop uh, new materials upscale to industrial production, speaking about uh, tens and hundreds of kilograms uh, per year. And uh, we also do the material analysis uh, like XRD, BET, SCM. And uh, we also do the calcination and surface treatment of uh, nanofiber materials. And uh, we also provide our customers with lamination and functionalization of nanofibers. For uh, production and development, uh, we are actually using, um, uh, the centrifugal spinning technology, which uh, actually works on principle of spinning nanofibers from uh, polymer solution. And basically we make nanofibers like sugar candy, candy cotton. There is then other technologies which are uh, able to produce nanofibers. They are called electro spinning, for example. We also have one lab, uh, lab tool uh, based on electro spinning but uh, we mainly concentrate on uh, centrifugal spinning technology. We also develop our own uh, spinning machines. Uh, here on this picture, you can see our, our first pilot line, which is based and is dedicated to development of new nanofiber materials and applications. 
Um, we call our inorganic nanofibers NNF serum, and we can produce them in uh, like 3D cotton-like structure, which you can see here, or we can mill them down to, to powder structure. Uh, inorganic nanofibers, uh, they are special functional material in the form of fibers. You can basically imagine uh, like nanoparticles which are sintered into the fiber structure. The main advantage of inorganic nanofibers are the, the high surface area, big, uh, uh, big uh, diameter to, to the length uh, ratio. And uh, they are also uh, very, they have surface which is accessible for gas and liquid or, or other, other materials. Uh, the benefit over nanoparticles uh, is that they are not porous. Uh, nanoparticles are not porous. Uh, they have different morph morphology. They also have big surface uh, tension, so uh, they tend to settle down in, in different solutions and dispersions. So uh, inorganic nanofibers are much better to handle because they are larger objects but they still maintain the properties of uh, nano particles basically and uh, the applications we are focusing and we are developing with our partners as a material supplier are uh, in lithi lithium ion batteries as anode or cathode we've developed successfully uh, the inorganic uh, lithium battery separator we are working on development of fuel cell separators. Uh, the great potential of inorganic, for inorganic nanofibers are in catalysts or in catalyst support material because we can actually incorporate active nanoparticles directly into the fiber structure. So uh, we can uh, actually use uh, nanofibers as a support for example, palladium, platinum nanoparticles. Uh, we can make photocatalytic uh, materials. Uh, nanofibers are tested as a thermal is uh, insulators. Uh, we have several applications developing uh, ceramic and uh, polymeric composites. Uh, we have developed uh, inorganic material and patented, uh, which is used for sorption of VOCs and. Uh, many other materials. So inorganic nanofibers we are developing are based on aluminum dioxide, silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, zirconium dioxide, cerium zirconium, and many other uh, ceramic or, or inorganic materials. Uh, basically, we like to say that we are the only company in the world which is focusing on development and production of such portfolio of uh, inorganic nanofibers. Here is uh, just short introduction how nanofibers, inorganic nanofibers are made by centrifugal spinning forces. So basically we take a polymer solution. We always need to have a base polymer. We dissolve it uh, in a solvent. Uh, in most of our materials, we are dissolving polymer in water. So uh, we have quite green process. We add precursors in the form of salt. We mix it together and we prepare polymer solution. Then uh, we apply centrifugal forces and we spin so-called precursor nanofibers. Uh, they have cotton-like structure. Then we actually applied heat treatment. We insert uh, the precursor nanofibers into the furnace and we remove base polymer from the structure and we let uh, the oxidation of inorganic nanofibers which they center together in the form of fibers. So here on this picture, you can see quite nice mesoporous uh, fiber structure. Uh, this is uh, silicon dioxide. Uh, we can do the post treatment. Uh, that means that we can mill, we can prepare dispersion. Sorry. And, uh, the average diameter of our fibers, do you hear me guys? Claire? Yes, that's very well. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I lost, I lost uh, my, my headphones. Uh, the fiber diameter is uh, from 250 to 800 nanometers. It depends on type of the, the inorganic uh, material. Uh, the fiber length is in millimeters or centimeters. It can be modified by, by milling. Uh, 
fiber structure can be like powder or cotton like material and crystal structure of the materials depends on calcination temperature and also the surface area of uh, the material depends on the calcination temperature uh, the very important notice is here that we can actually functionalize uh, the polymer solution by different catalytic or functional nanoparticles and we can add for example the antibacterial or any sensoric uh, function to to the nanofiber uh, itself so we can actually have antimicrobial uh, nanofibers which are then applied into the composites uh, where we create uh, antimicrobial uh, composite materials uh, this is uh, just to show you the, the cotton like structure on this picture you see uh, the nanoparticles which are embedded directly into the fiber structure so they do not wash out uh, in uh, for example in uh, in filters and this is the suspension of uh, uh, cotton like uh, structure uh, fibers so uh, this suspension is stable for for ages you know because the fibers are quite long and and they stick together uh, okay, so where we uh, actually test and where we develop uh, uh, composite materials with inorganic nanofibers. Uh, we are material providers, so we always prepare and tune the nanofiber properties uh, to meet our partners' requirements in order to meet the, the specific length or uh, surface area or functionality. Uh, we work on two fields uh, with our partners on ceramic composites where we use uh, inorganic nanofibers as uh, inorganic fillers uh, we had three projects uh, one was focused on adding uh, inorganic nanofibers into the concrete uh, the second one was by incorporating inorganic nanofibers into the dental cement this is still ongoing and uh, we had the project where we use uh, inorganic nanofibers as a filler for uh, dental materials which were printed uh, by 3D printers. On the field of polymeric composites, uh, we are developing uh, 3D filaments or filaments for 3D printing where we actually try to improve the mechanical properties. Uh, we had uh, a previously very interesting project uh, which we plan to continue in uh, when we were functionalizing the ski running surface, uh, uh, the material, the polymer, which is used for ski running surface, uh, we functionalized by inorganic nanofibers in order to, to get better properties, I will introduce later. And uh, we also, uh, apply inorganic nanofibers in functional paints uh, where we add antimicrobial uh, function to the uh, coatings. So if we speak about ceramic composites, uh, I was mentioning uh, the concrete application, dental cement and dental 3D printing materials. On this uh, CM images, you can see uh, nice uh, fibers incorporated in, uh, this is in cement or in concrete. This is as well. So uh, the, the main uh, goal is to improve mechanical and functional properties of ceramic composite materials. Uh, the guys who spoke uh, before me actually explain all the problems uh, with uh, uh, nano fillers in composite materials. And I have to admit and agree with them that uh, uh, those are the main challenges, you know, to, to prepare stable dispersion and uh, to find the, the optimal concentration of nano material which is incorporated into the composite structure those are two main challenges uh, and uh, there are like a lot of problems which need to be solved uh, the main is like to to prepare homogeneous dispersion and then to find uh, the proper concentration and also test the, the properties of the final composite. So it's very, very difficult 
and uh, that's uh, why we actually focus on uh, also on different applications as catalysts where there is much easier challenges uh, to, to overcome than with composite materials. But we still have partners who are interested in our materials uh, as the fillers for composites, so we provide them, we still collaborate them. But uh, I see this way and uh, this, uh, this application will need more time uh, to go commercial. Advantages of uh, uh, nanofibers uh, incorporated in the composite materials is that we can work with very low concentration. Here you, you can see uh, the example of ceramic, uh, ceramic uh, composites. Uh, we can add mechanical functionality creating bridges between the crystals. So here you see uh, that uh, the idea of using or the reason why uh, our partners are using nanofibers is that they, they think they believe that the fibers will create bridges between crystals of their materials and uh, will improve the mechanical properties. And uh, also because we can functionalize its surface, uh, it can actually add like chemical functionality. So we can have the anti-microbial uh, properties of the composites or uh, we can actually use the fibers as a chemical bonders uh, in, inside the composites. Here uh, you, you see uh, the example of uh, preparation of uh, dispersion of uh, aluminum dioxide nanofibers and silicon dioxide nanofibers. So this was done within one diploma work at uh, the University of Brno. Uh, and the student was uh, trying to prepare the homogeneous and stable uh, dispersion of nanofibers, which are then incorporated in the cement or in the concrete composites. Uh, here you see that uh, he used uh, three different surfactants to make uh, the stable dispersion and only SDS, uh, which is this one, was working. Uh, it was able to, to reach quite stable suspension. And here you see the concentrations uh, of the nanofibers inside. So he was able actually to prepare with SDS a uh, very interesting uh, dispersion, which he then used in uh, uh, the cement preparation. And here you actually see uh, the, in, on the graphs, the improvement on bending tensile thing at uh, 1 300 uh, Cs of uh, temperature. Uh, this is the reference sample, and those are uh, the samples with uh, nanofiber fillers. So you, here you can actually see that with uh, silicon dioxide nanofibers in very low uh, concentration, you were able to reach uh, interesting, interesting mechanical improvements. Uh, the same was uh, actually reached with aluminum dioxide nanofibers. And here is a comprehensive strength. Uh, so again, there was uh, almost 50% improvement with very low, very low loading factor. Uh, we also uh, develop uh, the 3D printing materials. Oh, sorry, sorry, this is... Uh, yeah, this is about ceramic composites, and this slide is about polymeric composites. Uh, on the field of polymeric composites, uh, we are developing, or our partners uh, with our support are developing uh, the materials for 3D printing, the filaments. Uh, we are developing the ski running surface and the functional paint, as I was mentioning before. Again, the problems are the same as with ceramic composites. So uh, let's move to, to the project, which was focused on improving the, the ski uh, surface uh, properties. Uh, PE Litten is actually the reference, is the current polymer, which is used uh, uh, for standard ski running uh, surface. And here you see we used uh, actually two types of uh, silicon dioxide nanofibers. One is called a sorbent. Uh, with a surface area around 800 uh, square meters per one gram of material. And uh, this is uh, silicon dioxide, which is made of uh, water glass precursor. This is a very cheap uh, and commercial available material. The surface area is somewhere around uh, 150 square meters per, per gram. 
and on this picture you can see the improvement in friction coefficient of the friction coefficient of the scanning uh, surface so again we were able to to increase uh, the, the friction coefficient quite by quite interesting uh, percentage here uh, it's uh, uh, the project where we are developing uh, antibacterial uh, composite materials for uh, 3D print filaments. Uh, we are developing this material with one of the largest uh, 3D printer uh, producer in the world. And uh, we are using as a base material, we are using PLA, uh, which uh, normally is used for filaments, for 3D filaments. And we were actually incorporating different concentrations of uh, silicon dioxide nanofibers, which are functionalized by 500 ppm of uh, uh, silver nanoparticles. So by the change of the color, you see uh, the deloading of the nanofibers. Here there is 1%, half percent of uh, silicon dioxide nanofibers and you go down. So by the color, you can actually see quite nice, we were able to, to reach quite nice and homogeneous uh, distribution of uh, nanofibers and nanoparticles of uh, silver. Uh, this work is done also by support of uh, Czech uh, uh, University. On the, this SEM, you can see uh, the fibers which were used. In this case, it was silicon dioxide. And uh, on this table, you can actually see uh, the, the properties uh, on tensile strength we were able to, to reach. So with uh, silicon dioxide, by loading 1% you know, of silicon dioxide, uh, we were able to improve by more than 40% uh, the tensile strength, which uh, was uh, quite interesting. It was the first test. Now in the next stage, we plan to actually go for first pilot, uh, pilot tests, where we will actually pull the filament. We will try to print some, uh, some uh, specific shapes by, by 3D printers and we will measure uh, the improvement of mechanical properties on printed parts, which is very important because the laboratory tests uh, not always uh, guarantee the good results in a real application. And uh, here uh, we can see that uh, with this uh, composite material, we were able to actually uh, reduce uh, the Staphylococcus aureus uh, bacteria. Uh, we were not able to uh, reduce uh, the E. coli or uh, this type of bacteria. Uh, we don't know why we need to repeat antibacterial tests, but uh, we still believe that there is a quite interesting room to, to develop uh, filament for 3D printers with better mechanical properties and with antibacterial uh, properties. Uh, this is say, everything about our projects related to composite materials. I don't want to take uh, more of your time because we are running quite late. And uh, thank you for your attention and I'm ready to, to, to discuss uh, further uh, potential questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Jan. And as you can hear from our three super interesting presentations, we literally could talk all day on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what 